Usually, I'd start an episode of Eons by telling you about the discovery of some strange fossil or setting the scene for a world-changing event like an ice age or an extinction. But today, I want to try something a little different. Instead of thinking about a story, I want you to stop and think about the thing I'm doing here. Like right now, literally, that I'm standing here and I'm telling you a story. Because the evolution of our ability to speak is its own epic saga, and I think it's worth pausing to appreciate that. It's taken several million years to get to this moment where I can tell you about how it took several million years for us to get here. And yes, there are other animals alive today that communicate in sophisticated ways, like whales, elephants, and crows, just to name a few. Still, our vocal abilities as a species are pretty unique. They're part of what makes us human. From the anatomy of one particular bone in our throats and the proportions of our vocal tract to the morphology of our ears, paleoanthropologists are piecing together the puzzle of when and how this adaptation arose. And while speech itself doesn't fossilize, the fossil record of our ancestors and relatives can still give us important clues about the time when we first talked. Now, this story could start between 400 and 360 million years ago, when the first ancient tetrapods transitioned from life in the water to life on land, and evolved lungs and a movable tongue. Controlling both of these with precision is important for creating many different sounds that make up human speech. Or it could start between about 8 and 6 million years ago, when our lineage, the hominins, split off from the ancestors of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. While there's no question that they can communicate with vocalizations, gestures, and expressions, they can't speak like us, despite decades of effort to teach them how. And our earliest hominin relatives probably couldn't talk like us either. Because the first piece of fossil evidence that can be used to reconstruct hominin vocalization comes from the skeleton of a juvenile Australopithecus afarensis dated to 3.3 million years ago. This special bone is called the hyoid. It's a U-shaped bone that sits in your neck just below the level of your jaw, and it doesn't connect to any other bone. Instead, it's held in place by muscles and ligaments. In humans, the hyoid is an important attachment point for the muscles of the tongue. It does that in chimps too, but in chimps and in most other living apes, it also helps support structures called the laryngeal air sacs. Now, we don't know exactly what these things do. Some researchers have suggested that they might help make vocalizations louder and help primates call for longer or more often without hyperventilating. But they also seem to introduce new, lower resonances to vocalizations and reduce differences between higher-pitched sounds, both of which would make human speech sounds harder to understand. And here's the thing, the hyoid of Australopithecus afarensis looked more like those of chimps and gorillas than it does like ours, which means that this hominin likely had air sacs attached to their hyoid. So her species probably couldn't speak like we do. And that one hyoid is the only one we have from any species of Australopithecine. The hyoid is a small, fragile bone, so it's one of the least well-known bones in the hominin fossil record. In fact, the next oldest hyoids we've ever found come from a site that's almost 3 million years younger. In that span of time, the Australopithecines disappeared, and our own genus, Homo, evolved, with some populations even making their way out of Africa to Asia and Europe. And in a cave site in northern Spain called Cima de los Huesos, or the Pit of Bones, is where those next oldest hyoids were found. They've been dated to around 450,000 years old, and belong to members of the species Homo heidelbergensis. This species may be the common ancestor of Neanderthals and our own species, Homo sapiens, or it might just be a close relative of both. And while both of the hyoids from this site are incomplete, what is preserved looks a lot more like our hyoid than the hyoid of Australopithecus afarensis or a chimp. So these hominins probably didn't have laryngeal air sacs. But that doesn't necessarily mean they could talk like us, at least not based on their hyoid bones alone. 
See, along with the lack of laryngeal air sacs, members of our species also have unique vocal tract proportions. You can split the vocal tract above the larynx or voice box into two basic parts. The mouth makes up the horizontal part and the pharynx makes up the vertical part, the bit between the mouth and the voice box. In adult humans, these two parts are about the same length. This allows us to make three of the different vowel sounds, A, I, and U, and to make them sound really distinct from each other. And almost all human languages have at least three vowels, and they tend to be these three. This might be because they sound the most different from each other, so they're less likely to be misheard. But some anthropologists don't think that other hominins had these same proportions. For example, researchers previously suggested that Neanderthals had much shorter vertical parts of their vocal tracts and longer horizontal parts. Human infants and chimpanzees also have short vertical segments of their vocal tracts and can't make those distinct vowel sounds as a result. But that fossil site in Spain can also give us clues about this piece of the puzzle. Because there's one individual with a nearly complete skull and all seven neck vertebrae that researchers have used to estimate the lengths of the two parts of the upper vocal tract. They found that the horizontal part was actually only a little bit shorter than the vertical part. This makes the fossil's proportions more like those of a 10-year-old human child than an adult. And 10-year-olds can still make these same distinct vowel sounds, meaning this almost half a million-year-old hominin probably would have been able to do it too. Some of our more recent relatives also seem to have had vocal tract proportions similar to that individual. When anthropologists reconstructed the vocal tract length of one adult Neanderthal from France dated to between 50,000 and 70,000 years ago, they found that the horizontal section of his upper vocal tract was slightly shorter than the vertical section. So he too could probably make the full range of sounds found in human speech. And there's more anatomical evidence for speech in Neanderthals than just one reconstructed vocal tract. Bringing it back to the hyoid bone, we found two from these extinct relatives of ours. One is from another cave site in Spain and dates to around 43,000 years ago. It's incomplete, but was described as being almost indistinguishable from a modern human hyoid. The second is a little older, dating to around 60,000 years ago, and comes from a site in Israel called the Kabara Cave. It also looks a lot like our hyoid bones. The scientist who worked on this bone even CT scanned it to see if its internal structure was a match for a human hyoid. See, bone can actually change or remodel its microscopic architecture over time based on how it's being used. So if a Neanderthal was using muscles and ligaments that attach to its hyoid the same as we do, CT scans of our hyoids should look similar too. And they did, which means that both the outside and the inside of the hyoid of this Neanderthal suggests that he was capable of making human-like speech sounds. But being able to make human-like speech sounds is only half the story. The other half is being able to hear them. While paleoanthropologists haven't found many fossil hyoids, they have found a lot of skulls. These allow them to study things like the size and shape of the ear canals and sometimes even the tiny bones of the ear themselves because they're contained within the temporal bones of the skull. And by comparing the fossils to the anatomy of living primates and humans, they can model the hearing ranges of our extinct relatives. Early hominins like Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus robustus have some features of their ears that look more like ours than like a chimpanzee. For example, they have a slightly shorter and wider passage leading from the outside of the skull to the membrane of the eardrum, and they have a malleus, one of the bones of the middle ear, that looks human-like. But the other two bones of the middle ear, the incus and the stapes, are more chimp-like in size and shape. And when their hearing abilities are modeled, they're not quite like ours or like those of a chimp. These early hominins seem to have been more sensitive to mid-range frequencies than modern humans or chimps are. More human-like ear anatomy and hearing abilities seem to originate in our genus Homo. Homo erectus fossils from Asia have some human-like features, and the hominins from Cima de los Huesos and the Neanderthals are even more similar in ear anatomy to Homo sapiens. The same hearing model used for the early hominins predicts that the later members of our genus probably had hearing abilities like ours. They lost a little bit of the mid-range frequency sensitivity seen in early hominins, 
but they expanded their range of maximum sensitivity to include higher frequencies. It's been suggested that greater sensitivity to those higher frequencies is important for hearing consonants, especially T, K, F, and S. And the use of consonants is a key feature that distinguishes human language from most animal communication. These changes in ear anatomy and hearing ability go along with the changes in the hyoid bone over time. Early hominins were more similar to our closest living relatives and the members of our genus Homo are more similar to us. And by the time we get to the Cima de los Huesos hominins and the Neanderthals, we seem to have all the anatomy in place for distinct vowel and consonant sounds, which is pretty incredible. Now, we don't know if this means these ancient relatives had language. This is still a big topic of debate and we don't have enough evidence to say either way. It might just come down to how we define language. But what we can say is that there's no anatomical reason they couldn't make or hear human-like speech sounds. And we know the Neanderthals were capable of very human-like behavior like caring for injured members of their groups and using objects for personal ornamentation. So maybe they were storytellers too. As the only hominins left, it's up to us to piece together the puzzle of our ancestors' speech abilities and use our own to tell this evolutionary story. Hey, if you want to learn more about all the ways in which Neanderthals were similar to us, as well as what happened to them, be sure to check out our episode When We Met Other Human Species. Now, I have to say this month's eontologists are awesome! Sean Dennis, Jake Hart, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, and Patrick Seifert. By becoming an eonite at patreon.com slash eons, you'll get fun perks including submitting a joke for us to read like this one from my friend Maddie Dahlman. Why why did the T-Rex need a nap? Because he was wiped out. Oh, I need a nap after this script. Thanks, Maddie, for submitting your joke. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Constantine Hassa studio. Subscribe at youtube.com eons for more adventures in deep time.